Blessed be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were established by, astonished by him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they shall see, and that which they have not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire for him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in no contempt, no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed from our inequities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, We have all turned to our own ways, and the Lord has lit on us the inequity of us all. He is oppressed, and he was afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. Like the lamb that is led to slaughter, and like the sheep that before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a preservation of justice, he was taken away. He could have imagined the future, for he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By 
Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. That was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. You want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him.
crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Something has happened, is happening now. It moves still towards its completeness. Even before the events of last night that propelled us to that which we recall now with his crucifixion, John's telling of the good news has Jesus offering as part of the la his last public teaching the proclamation that we cannot ignore. Now is the judgment of this world. 
Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So what is the ultimate point of good news when the powers of the day seemingly win? The ruler of this world was driven out, literally to confront Jesus, and not just Pilate as the symbol, but the various groups with their competing agendas, ironically each with their fear and anxiety. All of this seems to converge as Jesus is in and at the center of it all in Jerusalem and seemingly threatens their insecure grasp on the situation, or rather their perception of the world themselves and especially God. You see, Jesus threatens almost every conventional way of thinking and being. And so they had no choice in their minds but to get rid of him, and they killed him. The authorities of the day concluded this unpleasantry puts an end to something before it could get far worse and threaten their sensibilities. And yet we know that what was meant by the leaders in that time and place to be an end was really only a beginning of something that is still being felt to this day. What was seen by society standards as torture is the saving action. This is at the heart of what is proclaimed, even celebrated this day, how God takes what is seen as foolishness by some, a stumbling block by others, a shameful and humiliating death by still more, or simply an outright murder, and transforms this event to be the means of new life. This day is God's Friday. The sentence of death is pronounced upon evil itself. Evil, the absence of God, is condemned, stripped of its power on the bare wood of a cross. We see this day that love, faced with rejection, overcomes with more love and ultimately can win. In the cross of Good Friday, Jesus not only confronts our worst fears of life and death itself, but demonstrates there is no limit to what this kind of love can do. It transforms who we are and the life we live and share. This day holds up the truth that this action is meant as a gift, better still a ransom for you and me, who were enslaved by something that kept you and me from the fullness of life and love of God. And this day is about our liberation, yours and mine, not judgment about someone else. This day is, about, is not about someone else. It's about what Jesus does for you and me. It is about God's action. The God event, God's Friday, has transformed what was to be an instrument of a shameful and horrible death to become the very means to eternal life, a whole and right relationship with God. So this and every Good Friday, it causes us to ask questions of ourselves. So what are those things that we're still afraid of, ashamed of, embarrassed about, insecure about, feeling inadequate because of, or find ourselves worrying to the point of simply being stuck? What do we need to take to the cross? What is being done on the cross of Christ gives us that new life? The cross now represents how we and all we relate to can be transformed and brought towards what is right and complete, not perfect by our worldly standards, but being perfected by God's, finding out our completeness, in other words, in God's sight. This is what makes this day more than simply a commemoration of a good man who was stricken down. This is more than a day of mourning. It is a passage itself. God, who was present at Golgotha, is present here today and is just as concerned about how to lead you to the fullness of that right and complete, that new life that is promised to each of us into baptism in Christ.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Ken, Nettie, and Wendell, our assisting bishops, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community and around the world, for those about to be baptized or renew their baptismal vows, that God will confirm his church in faith increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are the enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it, and turn the hearts of those who resist it, and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died it in the peace of Christ, those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter in the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life 
in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the, and the power, power and, and the, the glory, glory forever, forever and ever. Amen. 
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God, now and forever.